nice to be back in such a balmy day. <laughs> this is January, huh? <laughs> Boy. But it's, it is great to be back, and I appreciate uh, the invitation, and I welcome the opportunity to say hello to all the Star Trek fans in GB. So, um, rather than my uh, pontificate on subjects that you have absolutely no interest in, why don't we just open for discussion and you ask me what you will, and if I have an answer, I'll be happy to go back, and then you're, you're told to go home and to let you know, and it, it goes on at infinitum ad nauseum. But I, pardon? Or just go on reality TV. I'm sorry? Or just go on reality TV to get auditions. I'm not, I'm not following what you're saying. I, I just sort of finished the story. <laughs> and, and then you can raise your hand and ask me something. Um, so I, I read and I, uh, it was a very dramatic scene. Uh, Captain, the ship is about to blow up. What are we going to do? Kind of thing. And after I got done, everybody looked at each other and said, "Yeah, but can you make it funny? <laughs> funny? I mean, I, I didn't see where in the in the text there was any room for being funny in such a perilous circumstance. But you know, actors are whores, and." Uh, <laughs> I'll give you what you want. <laughs> so uh, it came out, Captain. Guess what? The sheep is about to blow up. <laughs> and that's what got me the, the part, um, believe it or not. And um, as a matter of fact, I, I, they asked me to wait outside, and I waited outside. And then the other actor came in, who I had worked with in a, in a series called Jericho. Uh, we both played Frenchmen uh, in that one. And um, he went in, and uh, he never came out. And nobody else ever came out. And I was there for almost two hours, and there was nobody around. The sun was going down. And uh, what happened was everybody had left by another door. They had left through Gene Roddenberry's other door into the hall. And um, they had neglected to tell me uh, what my status was. So I waited and waited, and then finally the customer came over and he said, you're Walter Koenig? And I said, this is come with me. And I went with him to the, uh, to the wardrobe, and uh, I'm, 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 not, I'm not kidding. By now, the sun was going. I mean, there was, he had turned on the lights. And immediately he dropped to his knees in front of me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> What kind of an audition is this? <laughs> and um, he then pulled out a cloth measuring ruler and measured between, from my crotch to my cuff. And, I, and he told me that, you know, you, you have to have a costume, don't you? So um, that's how I learned that I was cast on Star Trek. <laughs> Guys on his knees in front of me, and he's measuring my crotch. <laughs> Auspicious start to what has become, an, you know, an amazing reality for me. You know, what an incredible phenomenon to be involved with something all these years, and I must say, part of the time dragging and kicking, uh, because you know, one wants the identification to be broader. One wants the the, the community, the in the uh, film community, and the public community to um, have a sense that you, you, know, you can do more than only work that good for gift in. But here I am, all these years later, and it's still there. And although, although I say, kicking and screaming, I certainly come to some kind of um, reconciliation with it. And more than that, you know, I'm very grateful for having had this career, because there have been you know, other opportunities uh, as a consequence of being involved in Star Trek. And I don't know for a fact that I'd even be an actor today had it not been for Star Trek. And the, the sustaining uh, feature that it had in my life that I was able to sustain an income. So um, I'm tickled, you know, and I'm tickled that Star Trek is still around. I'm, I'm grateful to the fans. Uh, for their support all these years. 
And uh, I guess that uh, brings us up to the present. And as you may know, I, I did a, a, a internet uh, episode of Star Trek called To Serve All My Days. Have any of you been able to download that yet? Yes or no? Yeah. Uh, if there had been time, now I'm going to, Richard's going to get all upset with me. If there had been time, sometime during this programming, I, I actually have a copy with me to show, but there's no time, so uh, you, you can't see it. I don't know when, I don't know when we would do it. It runs an hour. Um, <laughs> in any event, it was very gratifying, and uh, they, they, I was approached by these fans, uh, if I would be interested in doing it. And my initial reaction, of course, was no, but when they explained to me that I could have pretty much have my, whatever idea I might have um, in mind, they would, uh, they would endeavor to, to write that into a story. Um, I reconsidered, particularly when one of your own, a gentleman named John Carrigan, told me that he had suggested, suggested that uh, they do a story where Chekhov, a uh, 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 story based on the deadly years, in which everybody grew old except for Chekhov. Well, in this case, Chekhov uh, would start to age very rapidly as a consequence of having this virus in him and traumatic external events transpiring to activate it. And uh, I thought it was a brilliant idea for a story because it what I thought was, had always been missing uh, with the character was any kind of, you know, internal life, any kind of depth to his character. And this gave me a chance to explore how, how this character would approach impending demise, uh, what stages he would go through, and, and how he would react. So that's what this story is about. And uh, I'm, I'm tickled that we, we did it. The, the, the folks in, um, in upstate New York where we shot it were really wonderful and most of them were fans, you know, and the money that, that was put up to make this film was people took out of their pockets, you know. They weren't involved in the, any film industry. They just decided they wanted, you know, to do this, which is really uh, very inspiring. It's really inspiring. I, um, I, I love the opportunity, and I think the result is pretty good. Um, subsequent to that, uh, I did another uh, Star Trek uh, film for the internet called um, Of Gods and Men. And that is all professional actors, people you, you, you know, you all know. I mean, Michelle, of course, uh, was one of the principals, and she did a wonderful job. And um, um, Alan Ruck and J.G. Hertzler, and Gary Graham, uh, and um, um, Wang, what's his name? Garrett. Garrett Wang, yeah. He was terrific. And, it was, and we, we shot it there. We shot it there. It wasn't the same group. I mean, it wasn't the same company, but we shot it there. And they had all these extraordinary sets. It was museum quality sets and costumes. So well on its way to being uh, finished. And if, if one is to believe the trailer, then we really got something special. Of course, you can't always believe the trailer. The trailer is sometimes, you know, you take the best six minutes in the movie, and you stick it in the trailer, and then there's nothing left. I don't think, I don't think that's the case here, though. I think we, we do have something we can all be very proud of, and which the fans will enjoy. And it's a what-if story. It's a what-if story. Uh, and I, the only thing I can tell you is, um, because I can tell you what, what, what they showed in the trailer, and it's what if there hadn't been a Captain Kirk. So I think you'll, I think you'll find this uh, really uh, um, a, a very exciting venture. Any other questions? Yes? Did Michael Garibaldi ever forgive you for messing with his mind? For messing with his mind? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know. I know. <laughs> Actually, he was he was he had been programmed by Bester for forgiveness, so it wasn't a matter of any conscious uh, determination on his part. He, it was, he, when, he, when he sees a lamppost with a particular kind of little 
um, cornucopia, and I'm making this up as I'm going along, folks. Uh, it triggers that memory of, oh, I forgive him. And so, uh, yeah, he forgave me. Check-up point of view was, would be um, um, Spectre of the Gut. I had, you know, I had a lot of fun with that. Got the girl, got the die, got the come back alive again. Uh, yeah, for all those people, uh, I don't know if you've, if you've gone to um, new, uh, newvoyages.com where, uh, where you can download to serve all my days. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of um, hue and cry about the ending. Of my episode, uh, I, 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 mean, I must not go astray here. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Spectre the gun, right? Um, and the human cry was because Chekhov expires. You know, it's Chekhov's demise. I think very well done. I mean, you know, well told story. But people got on the internet. Some of the main well have been you, um, who were outraged by the fact that we had violated. Star Trek canon in killing off a character who they know comes back, you know, they know comes back um, in the movies. And uh, I have several rebuttals to that, one of which is that, you know, you know, this is a story, this is a story taken out of canon. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a possibility, it's a story that's a possibility. And what happens to this character? It's not a story that that is consistent with the series, very specifically, we're, we're exploring a character, and which we never got to do in 40 years. I mean, that in itself should have said people, you know, 40 years and you don't know anything about this guy except that he has a middle name. Uh, and, and, this, and, this, and, this, and this episode did that. But um, if, if you're worried about canon and somebody should have complained about Spectre of the Gun, when Chekhov dies and comes back to life, and there's no logic to that, because if you know, the whole premise of the story was if you know that it's an illusion, then it can't hurt you, then the bullets can't hurt you. Chekhov died before they made that discovery. So how does he come back to life? You know? I went to the editor, and God knows why, I mean, uh, other than because I had a certain f sense of um, in, in, uh, writing integrity about the story. I said, how, how do we do this? I mean, how, how does this work? He says, yeah, we, we thought about that. And then we said, forget it. <laughs> so if you, if you take umbrage at, at Chekhov's die in the story that is told out of canon quite purposely, then somebody should have complained about Spectre of the Gun. Anyway, that's that. Something else? Yes. How many of the original series? No. <laughs> I, I well, I watched the I watched the bunch of Next Generation. I thought it was I thought it was intellectually st stimulating. Uh, no, I did. I, I think you know they, they had some interesting ideas and. And I don't mean that in any way grudgingly or patronizingly. I hope it doesn't sound that way. That's not the case at all. Um, I think our story was more visceral, was more emotional. I think you, I think the, uh, the identification with characters was stronger from our show. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, simply, be, simply because they were, they were more well, flesh and blood. The characters were, you know, you, you, you got to know them. At least the, the, the principal characters, the, the three main guys. Um, but I thought uh, Next Generation was, you know, extremely well done. Um, I didn't watch very many of the other shows, or, or, or very many episodes of the shows. I saw a couple of Deep Space Nine. My son appeared on one, so I watched that. Um, and then um, I watched the episode, uh, was it Deep Space Nine? Uh, with the Tribbles? That was Deep Space Nine. I watched that one, obviously. Um, <laughs> Did I, did, I don't know if you've heard the story, but I came on the set, uh, you know, unannounced, to watch them shoot this, because I really wanted to, I'm talking about the scene with the triples, because I wanted to see what they had done 
with our, the, the sets to make them look more like the original sets. So I was standing behind everybody, and uh, and uh, Colin Meany and Ned Eddie. Oh, I can't remember his name. He's doing so well now too. The doctor, Sid. Yeah, they were standing there, flipping open the communicator, and it kept popping back closed. You know? So how are you doing? I don't know. It was like something like. And I watched, and I got more and more frustrated. And finally, from the back, I yelled, "Cut!" I hadn't even realized I had said it, you know. And everything stopped. And I walked forward. I said, "Hand me that, please." <laughs> This is the way it's done all the time. I'm praying, dear God, this way. You know, stay open. I said, you got that? <laughs> I understand that Alexander uh, tells that story as well. I hope it's consistent with what I told you. <laughs> Somebody else? Yes. series shooting. We had technical advisor during the first movie. Um, and there was always consultations and always calls to Caltech uh, for not the reality of the things we were doing, but for the, the projection of reality. Could they at some time be a possibility? So yeah, it was, a, a, you know, it was done with a considerable amount of integrity. As in, you know, and it's of course all proven to be true. Well, except Dini. Give us time. Pardon? Give us time. Yeah, okay. Are you a scientist? Yeah. Okay, somebody else? Yes. Did you enjoy writing the Thank you. Or just say to a lonely tea chicken tea or something like that. Marvelous. Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Very abbreviated introduction. It's good to be here with you. And this is a rather abbreviated crowd for a rainy London uh, evening. But we're just getting started now, aren't we? Hello, because George, you can provide your own 30 year plus maker. <laughs> It's um, it's kind of odd. I haven't done like, a convention, I guess, in a couple of years, and I, you know, it's been. Um, whoever would like to kick the ball off or on this FA Cup third round day, or um, yeah, over here. Um, we had a lot of fun at Team Trace. How he. 
he for so long went through that. You know, there was, there was, he, and he hated me in, in a very, in a very humorous way because I could come in and always sit beside him the, the next makeup chair to him. And uh, you know, he had been, he's already been there for 45 minutes and he's just getting his, you know, teeth put in or something. And he's, and I kind of bounce in and, morning, Michael, you know? <laughs> you bastard. The pressure is always on the, on, on the number one. Yeah. Just a curiosity. Uh, do you actually have engineering skills? I mean, are you good at fixing things as Chief O'Brien? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything. You got anything there needs repairing? I'm your man. Especially the, the more complex it's, you know, electronic. Stuff like that, the better. <laughs> no, I have no experience at all. I'm dreadful, and uh, you know, I, 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 I truly don't know. Have... Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Don't, yeah. on. Don't go over that side. It's a fucking Thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. It'll shoot you if you record over that side because Colin's yeah, over Yeah, Colin's over there. Don't fucking know him because of that witch. I'll edit that out when I get around to it. <laughs> well, you know, he means the previous convention. Cardassian clip that doesn't have me on it. <laughs> to me, of course, one of the most interesting, better looking of the Kardashians like this. There's usually about anywhere from eight to ten people watching you that could effectively change your life, at least your bank account, you know. <laughs> um, so I sit down there and I say, they're in range, sir. Fire. Oh, that was great. They said that was really good. Thanks a lot. I walk out the door. By the time I get home, I get a phone call from my agent. Says, "Oh, they thought you were really great. They want you to come back and do it again tomorrow." <laughs> okay. So I go back the next day, and instead of 15 actors going in, there's four actors going in to, to do it. So I walk into the door, and there's Ira Bear, who was the executive producer. He said, "That was a very intelligent reading." <laughs> I'm starting to think, how intelligent are you? <laughs> on there if you have got uh, uh, if they've got photos and they would like Keating and Mr. Connor Trenier. Actually, 
thought we were about 30. <laughs> no, I was told, I was told there were not too many people, but hey, that's a good show. So, where's everybody from? English? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? There's an American or two in here, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. Go, go, Texas. Texas. So anyway, this big snifter came, and we had these two lovely brandies, and we got the check. <laughs> It was 152 quid for a fucking Indian. <laughs> the brandies were 25 pounds. 25 pounds a shot. And it was kind of a really light pour, like, like you all do over here. It's oh, yeah. a light pour. So I tell you, if I'd known, I wouldn't have slugged it back in two, right? <laughs> Funny thing about that is, <laughs> Dominic then immediately goes on the way out of the restaurant. Oh, don't tell Ariana about that. <laughs> My wife. <laughs> I'm not gonna either. Uh, I could see that. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> so, anyway, to listen to you. Oh, I always forget who I'm talking to when I tell these stories. <laughs> it's out there. All right, fire at will. Where's uh? Fire at will. Ah. I I read this book a few years ago. But, um, it's called. Longitude. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, it's, it's a terrific book. book. It's a fantastic book. It's also it's also thin, so it doesn't take long. <laughs> um, but it's about this man Harrison, James Harrison, I believe it was, who invented the first seaworthy clock because you can't you can't find longitude without uh, some sort of measurement. And the easiest way, most effective way, was with a clock, but they couldn't do it because it would always rust, and you know there's that rocking problem on the boat thing. Uh, so, the, and it's nice because you can go to a museum here in London and see uh, all four of these different versions of his clock, and it's quite a big deal at the time. And this, the author, Davos Sobel, makes it really fascinating. Um, it's got sort of a, a, a Mozart Salieri thing with another uh, clockmaker. It's, it sounds boring as dirt, but it's really, really fascinating. Uh, it's as boring as Arthur and George, by the sound of <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, would you guys get involved um, in a movie if your characters were ever around? Sure. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. There's money, right? Yeah, we're getting paid. <laughs> and, and free food? <laughs> Is it a video? What if I don't get to be my Lobbying for a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start? Should we repeat the questions? Yeah, it's cool. Uh, what have you been doing since Enterprise? Picking me bum. <laughs> I've been to stuff here and there. Uh, some Stargate Atlantis, I did a number of episodes of that, some other television stuff, and um, uh, not sleeping a great deal. Uh, that's uh, really <laughs> great. <laughs> I gotta say, you've all got voyages of blame, really. Why? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was boring. <laughs> no, I know there are different, you know, groups of, you know, Trekkie fans. Some people think our show is boring, do you know that? Extraordinary, extraordinary. Some people think our show was boring. I admit there were a couple of clunkers, but... Surely <laughs> not. I notice they're being awfully quiet right now. <laughs> they might be in the enemy camp. <laughs> It wasn't such a long time It was only four years Not such a long time They didn't answer all my prayers But now we cancel, they can kick my ass They can go to hell They should've made me captain anyhow Put me in the cat suit as well Cause I got tits and abs. Just as good as Jolene Blaylock, I've got looks and charm. Mountains higher than Connor Trinir, books and smarts. Just as much as Dr. Flux ever had, I've got game, I've got game. Right from the heart. <laughs> back for Sunday morning. Every you, did, you, went, you went with the divine side. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't have to uh, write my own bills. Anthony got a pup with personal assistant. I don't know what the fuck he was For, for what? I'm not entirely uh, sure. You gotta go to work tomorrow at 6, thank you. So did Jody, she got one too. Oh yeah, they will... They, they, I didn't give you assistance. They, would, they, come, they come to set and there'd be three people after them. <laughs> <laughs> go get my lunch. <laughs> Pretty funny. Uh, yes sir, go on, you were first and then we'll come to you, Ryan. Uh, this is the uh, other part of the show. This is chapter four. This is where it gets very personal. Anyone else? Yes, down there. Would you like you to become a cat at all? Um, has, has the show affected your, uh, I guess, future role? I've been typecast as a devastatingly handsome man. <laughs> <laughs> you laughed at that. <laughs> I might be misled. Um, I don't know about, uh, I know, I think uh, all things considered, we, we kind of flew under the radar with Enterprise, um, professionally speaking. I think um, a lot of people in the business just haven't seen it. A lot of casting people never saw it. Uh, and it's a double edged sword. They think they know what it's about, and sometimes they don't always think that that's great. Uh, it's just always been there. Um, so uh, I, do, I don't think it's, it's not a problem having done Star Trek to then try and go out and get. session in just a moment. through my letterbox and, uh, and as it's been a year for me of uh, stage work which has meant that my evenings are busy I haven't been to the pictures so uh, I spend my uh, my last few nights off because that's what it is I'm living through the last few days of, of being an ordinary person before I go back into the theater next week I've been watching movies and it's mostly been a delightful experience. An astonishment. They could not imagine they were actually working with somebody so old. This past year has been, and I've had some good years in my life, and hope some good ones ahead too, but this past year has been the happiest year of my working life. So, that's me. Uh, so, there's nothing further for me to say about the past or the future, uh, it's over to you. And I think the rule is that the microphones are being passed around. Am I right? There's one where? Oh, up here in the center. Okay, so questioners are invited to come up here and speak, ask their questions, yes? You wouldn't know. Oh, sorry, I thought it was you who just made that remark. <laughs> If, if, listen, I'm very happy. If you can project like you, sir, if everybody can, <laughs> as well as you're doing, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad to, to operate on that principle. Yes, go, go ahead then. 